It's September 1st, and you are here with us on another episode of Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And it is I, Danielle Hallen. And we're wrapping up our fourth season. Unbelievable. Can you believe that? Four I really can't. years of Crime After Crime at this point. I, I remember when it was just a little, little teeny baby idea that we had at Crime Con back in 2018. That genuinely doesn't even feel like four years ago. How does time feel like so fast and so slow all at the same time? <laughs> Honestly, we did go through. We went through the 2020 time warp there and everything slowed down. Yeah. Everything got real confusing for a while. <laughs> yeah. Actually, when I think about 2020, it feels like we've been doing this show for eight years. But yeah. I know. <laughs> Are we refactoring in those extra years from that one year? Mm -hmm. or? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Some good seasons, though. Let me just tell you, not to toot our own horn, but yeah, I'm super happy with them. Some I good, love it. Good episodes, some good topics, and mm -hmm. uh, next month we're going to talk about a way that maybe some of those topics can come back around. Maybe yeah. depending on you and mm -hmm. Danielle and myself. I've got some idea cooking there, but you'll have to check it out next month. <laughs> Now, we got to get this episode going, and to do that, we have to get the results from last episode, YouTube Criminals. Danielle told the story of Omar and Gears TV, a streaming service that was illegally posting copyrighted content and making millions of dollars with Omar buying fancy sports cars and telling mm -hmm. people how to be successful on his YouTube channel. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I went into the story of Ryan Stone... <laughs> who thought by having a police chase, he could file copyright claims on all of the YouTube coverage and take their revenue. <clears throat> Instead, mm -hmm. he's in jail for life. How did it all play out, Danielle? Honestly, just as I thought it would. <laughs> just as I thought it would and just how it should. On Twitter, I received 33% of the vote, so that should already tell you guys everything you need to know. <laughs> Woo! And John received 67%. It was essentially the same thing on the website poll. I received even less, okay, 32%. And John received 68. Honestly, congratulations. That story was worth you winning like five times in a row because what an absolute dingus. <laughs> I just, and I can't take credit for it, ultimately. I mean, if, if Ryan Stone did anything creative in this whole nonsense <laughs> idea that he had, it was giving us the information to talk about him on this episode. Yeah, so I have to thank Ryan Stone and I'm gonna thank him with a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> so i guess that means i'm keeping the mug i actually don't i have know it. hold on it's uh i don't have the current one but i'm gonna go throwback Boom. oh my gosh i love it I, I love it i keep this one down here all the time it's one of my favorite mementos i have a, a whole little section of the wall there where it's, yeah it's like the <laughs> the youtube hundred thousand subscriber thing i've got my mm -hmm. first mic that doesn't work anymore i've got a lord yep. Arts bobblehead and i've got the crime after crime mug because i don't have a trophy for crime after crime for some reason we won't talk about it. we won't talk about it. don't bring it up we won't talk about it. No, because you absolutely did a great <laughs> job last episode. That story was way too good. I got the Ryan Stone I've, trophy. Yeah. So Honestly, might make you one because that was something else. <laughs> <laughs> today, today, Danielle, I'm mm -hmm. kind of excited about this one. I'm, I'm always I excited to tell you my stories, but every now and then they, they feel extra special. And coming off Ryan Stone, oh, I didn't think boy. I was going to be able to do it, but... Maybe. Oh man, look at you go. All Maybe. right. You're making me nervous. Mm, I'm nervous. Today now. we're looking into petty revenge. Oh man. All right, you guys. A research article titled The Revenge Motive in Delinquency, Prevalence and Predictors states that approximately one half of interpersonal assaults are motivated by revenge. Swiss. That's a wild statistic. Yeah. Yeah. Half? Yeah. And I mean, just Ooh. thinking about like I think everyone has had a revenge mm -hmm. fantasy i think everyone yeah. has thought at some point about like oh i'd really mm -hmm. like to get back at that person or um but the realities Such of it a personal crazy thing it makes you feel all sorts of weird ways yeah i've always gotten hung up on becoming the thing that you're trying to go after you know exactly like almost mm -hmm. even in the eye for an eye thing like you know oh someone yep. murdered my family i'm gonna go murder them instead well then you you're part of you're the just, thing exactly see i'm so happy we're on the same page with that because yeah. yeah you can't don't let yourself do it you guys don't do it but uh if you have gone down that path of even just thinking about it 
Swiss mm -hmm. researchers have found that just the thought of revenge causes a rush of neural activity in the brain. So it literally supports that thought that revenge is sweet, at least physiologically. That's crazy. That's crazy. But despite it being sweet, psychologicalscience.org notes that research shows the actual execution of revenge carries a bitter cost. Time, emotional and physical energy, and even, obviously, lives sometimes. Right. And, you know, when you think about revenge, I mean, what's the thing you're going after necessarily? Yeah. Isn't there some type of, okay, I'm finally even? Like, yeah. don't you think that's going to be good for you emotionally? Mm, those researchers Probably also not. found, yeah, they found that revenge doesn't give the Avenger the emotional catharsis that they are seeking. And it frequently causes an unending cycle of retaliation. So the feeling that you're looking for, you never yeah. actually get. And then on top nope. of that, now you've started this cycle where someone's going to come and get back mm -hmm. at you. Because even if they wronged you first, they probably don't remember that. <laughs> and now they yeah. feel like the yep. the scale is is tilted again. I feel like I'm listening to like my children arguing. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like the same thing, man. It just doesn't, it doesn't end. Well, and that retaliation cycle, I mean, yeah. if we were going to boil down gang violence to a very basic you know yeah, psychology exactly. like i think that's it you've got this kind yep. of revenge we'll get you back i'm gonna get you back mm -hmm. thing that just never ends yeah. um plus of course becoming an avenger usually means you have to wear tights and hang out with the hulk so you just you mm -hmm. don't want to do this you don't i mean i would hang out with the hulk but the whole like wearing tights like that all the time absolutely not i wonder what the <laughs> hulk i don't know i think the hulk smells a little funky like wouldn't you imagine really okay he, i can see that his sweat glands have also <laughs> increased his sweat in size. Glands. <laughs> he's got hulk big hulk smells armpits. a little funky yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh you know what it's worth the risk man he okay. seems interesting all right <laughs> She, she always no, gets starstruck by people. That's what <laughs> I do. It's my fault. It's just a me thing. It's mm. fine. <laughs> now, today we're focusing on cases where revenge is the motive, but the reason for that revenge is extremely petty. I'm really looking forward to this. Let's kick it off with a case told by the amazing Danielle Hallen. <laughs> little intro. <laughs> with soundtrack. All right. Now, petty revenge of even the smallest kind... I know we talked about how we've all had those moments, but it honestly kind of makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Obviously, we all think of revenge and things like that occasionally, but I've never been a petty person. I'm way too much of a people pleaser. The thought of conflict, <laughs> I just, I can't do it. And then when it's kicked all the way up to criminal activity, honestly, I have no words. On December 16th, 2021, a man that has chosen to remain unnamed, and I will get to that towards the end. We're going to call him Jeff for the purpose of this podcast. Okay. Casually was, I know, I know. He was casually making his way out of a Mexican restaurant parking lot in Fort Myers, Florida. It was just after 5 p.m. He had every intention, you know, of going home. Long day of work. He wanted to call it a day. But then those dreaded blue lights reflected in his rearview mirror. Mm, I hate that feeling. I feel like we can all feel it. I know yeah, that's like no, we can all feel it. No worse feeling in the world. <laughs> there really isn't. No, <laughs> he was being pulled over. So out steps Sheriff's Deputy Nico Irizarry, 25 year old, only four years on the force, walks up to the driver's side window and informs Jeff, you didn't fully stop at a stop sign. Which can I just tell you out of like, you know, how everyone has their thing when they're getting like pulled over, they see a cop, like the lovely thing on the highway where everyone decides to slow all the way down to like 35 miles an hour. Yeah. And it's just like a cluster of like very slow moving vehicles. Mm -hmm. I have the same, like that doesn't bother me. I will pass the police officer if I know I'm going the speed limit, but stop signs, I can't do it. I like will stop and count to five, if not to 10 to ensure. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I have a thing, right? These rolling stop signs, they're just unacceptable. <laughs> now, he, Jeff, was fully prepared to take his ticket or, you know, hopefully talk his way out of it into a warning. He cooperated with the officer, but very unexpectedly, things took a pretty large turn. Now, despite Jeff being pulled over for a simple stop sign violation, Deputy Irizarry suddenly decides to call for backup. Okay. Out of nowhere. All he was right. bringing in a canine officer to check the car for drugs. Okay. Now, at this point, obviously, Jeff is shocked, but he's still trying to be cooperative. He's patiently waiting for this canine to arrive, knowing 
this is all just a misunderstanding, assuming he was about to be released, but shortly into the search, the dog alerted. Despite Jeff's reassurances that there are no drugs in the car, Officer Irizarry continues to pull out 50 plus little bags filled with them. We're talking Xanax, fentanyl, oxy, Jeff. meth. Look, it Is was Jeff like Mary pharmacist? Poppins if she was a drug dealer. <laughs> like it just constantly pulling out new bags of drugs. So obviously on the spot, Jeff was arrested and swept off to jail. And these aren't just small charges, okay? We're talking felony drug charges oh, yeah. with Jeff facing an incredibly long time in prison. So this was a really big deal. Yeah, that's intent no. to sell and distribute. That's yeah. not personal use when you're talking about that amount and the way exactly. that it's been packaged. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All those little baggies, man. Mm -hmm. So Officer Irizarry ended up signing an affidavit explaining, you know, how he came to know of the drugs. After all, the whole process, you have to have probable cause for a search like that. And he claimed in the document that he signed that he had actually seen Jeff personally put the drugs into the car with his own eyes. So we're talking Florida. Unfortunately, trafficking and drugs, that is a very common thing. And so all of this seemed very plausible. Jeff was in a parking lot prior. Maybe there was a drug exchange that was going on. Deputy Irizarry could have been in a nearby parking lot and witnessed the entire thing go down. I mean, it sounds like a run of the mill thing. Jumped on a chance to pull him over at the rolling stop sign. But Jeff was infuriated. He adamantly denied that the drugs belonged to him. Which, again, I know sounds like the typical argument that's always given. I don't, I don't know how those gotten here. Mm -hmm. But he swore up and down that he did not use, buy, or sell drugs. And he had no clue how they got into his car. So right away, he called his attorney, a man named Donald Day, for assistance. And he explained what had happened, that he was completely cooperative with police. He was like, look, I'm a simple real estate broker. <laughs> like, I don't dabble in the world of drugs. And he genuinely didn't know what was going on. And knowing this man, Donald Day, is like, something here has to be off. Jeff just wasn't the kind of guy that you would expect to have those drugs on him, let alone that amount of drugs. He had never had any previous incidents, you know, involving drugs in his history. So Donald Day decided to take a deeper look into it, and he hired a PI right away. Now, to me, that says a lot. Yeah. According to and yeah, according to interviews with Donald, that's something that he has rarely ever had to do before as an attorney. But this was just so bizarre that he felt it was necessary right away because these charges were just not adding up. And sure enough, a handful of information was found that made this entire thing seem like a potential setup. Jeff was not just your average real estate broker. He was a man with a pretty large target on his back. Okay. So back in 2017, we're talking years prior, mm -hmm. he had been one of many witnesses in an insurance fraud trial. Okay. So the person charged was 37 year old Charles Custodio. And this was right around the time that Hurricane Irma ripped through Florida, damaged homes, leveled homes. And Custodio saw it as an opportunity to pocket a large amount of cash. So he falsified reimbursement documents. He even forged the signature of his landlord, who interestingly was also a client of Donald Day. Things are way too connected here. And Jeff, being a real estate broker, he just so happened to have some information on the case that ended up being the straw that broke the camel's back. So ultimately, Custodio was found guilty and he was sent to jail. And then the icing on the cake, right after that, the Board of Nursing revoked his nursing license because of it. Okay. So this absolutely infuriated Custodio. So much so that before being sent off to jail, he reached out to Jeff in a nasty message saying that he was going to ruin his life. Mm. You know, because it's it's his fault that Custodio was committing law. crimes and yeah, ripping off <laughs> insurance Absolutely. companies. Yeah. <laughs> of like and of the many witnesses too. He was like one of the last ones. Poor guy. I mean mm. in Custodio's eyes, it really was his fault that everything was happening. And so the grudge that he would never ultimately shake began. Now, I will say, and maybe this is just me, I feel like if this was like a violent criminal that had threatened him, maybe things would have been a bit different. I mean, if it were me and I was in a situation like that and someone threatened me, I'd probably brush it off as like big talk. Like you're just angry right now because of what happened, but like years down the line, you're not gonna yeah. think about this or whatever. 
So I have absolutely no idea if Jeff ever thought that this threat was real or took it seriously, but the PI dug up shocking information to show that Custodio all these years later was very serious about the threat. Mm. So the digging found that Custodio just so happened to be good friends with none other than Nico Irizarry. I'm so surprised. The police officer. Imagine that. <laughs> Puzzle pieces were falling into place. So could you imagine this poor guy? Years later, he's probably all but forgotten about this. Yeah, and yeah, and just trying to do the right thing. And, like, you know, what? He's trying to do yeah, the right like, thing. Yeah, come on now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Mm. Now, out of fear that this was just one big retaliation scheme, a call was put into the sheriff's department, Internal Affairs, in January of 2022. So just shortly after the arrest was made, this concern basically voiced that this arrest was probably not just and it was possible that these drugs had been planted on jeff all based around this threat from 2017 that custodio was going to ruin jeff's life and keep in mind we're like a month into this poor jeff is still sitting in jail yeah yeah <laughs> he i mean he's facing these huge charges you guys so sheriff carmen marcino immediately assigned a major crimes task force to look into the claims Hearing just those few concerns was pretty much enough to get the ball rolling, and they obviously immediately found this connection between Irizarry and Custodio, um, and then also began to collect supporting evidence prior to Jeff's arrest. In February of 2022, a warrant was obtained to search Irizarry's phone, and then the details of what actually had happened behind this arrest were all laid out on the table. So, on December 12th, 2021, Charles Custodio sent a text to his good friend and officer, Charles Irizarry, saying that he had something that he needed help with. Just a casual text, you know? Mm. And he proceeded to explain to Custodio that there was a man that he hated and he wanted arrested. He said, I was thrown in jail because of this man years ago. So he wanted revenge by doing the same thing to him and he laid his plan out. Now, so hold he on explained, a second. If, <clears throat> yes. if you're a police officer, Mm -hmm. And you have a friend reach out to you and say, oh, yeah. I want this guy thrown in jail because that's what he did to me. Mm -hmm. Are you not going to look at what those charges were and what happened around that? You would assume. Right? You would. You would, you would assume. But also, like, I have this whole thing, too, that I've been thinking about since I looked this up. That, like, at, at, why did the studio even feel comfortable going to him to begin with? Yeah, this I mean, unless they, you know, sometimes you have a like a childhood friendship or something. This is someone you've known for like twenty years. Yeah, he was your your college buddy. You know, he, he paid the rent for you for a while. Like you know, those those relationships can run deep. Like I I get making the call. I just don't mm -hmm. get the guy going. Okay, I'm gonna risk my career. <laughs> See, I don't know, though, because there was a 10-year difference, and when you see what he was offered... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I mean, it may explain a little bit, but still, I just have lots of concern. Okay. So, he explained that they wouldn't be working just the two of them, that there was a man named Scott Snyder that would also be in cahoots with them, and essentially, Custodio planned on obtaining a large amount of drugs, which, by the way, that probably cost him a ton of money. Mm-hmm. And he was going to give the drugs to Scott Snyder, this random guy that was the third man. Now, from there, Scott would somehow plant the drugs on Jeff by meeting with him. Now, any other scheme, this would probably be the most challenging part. Mm -hmm. But poor Jeff, okay? Real estate broker. He probably meets with all sorts of strangers all day long, giving people rides to look at houses. This was an absolute piece of cake. Yeah. So they figured that wouldn't be an issue. And then after the drugs were planted, that's when Irizarry would step in. So the plan was to have Irizarry in place at a specific location. And then once Jeff drove off into the sunset with the drug loaded car, he would successfully pull him over and make an arrest. Now, since this was a pretty massive, you know, huge favor to ask, it did come with benefits. Okay. So in return for his help, Custodio promised Irizarry a luxurious trip to Paris, along with the possibility of sexual favors. What? What? <laughs> From who? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> is he calling in? Is See, he calling in other friends? Hey, hey I just, Sheila. I don't. <laughs> I know. I have a plan. Um, <laughs> and you're a part of this plan. I honestly have absolutely no idea. But I mean, I, mean just, I just, like, I can't imagine this whole 
conversation. Like, hey, police officer friend of mine, I want you to arrest someone after I plant drugs on them. And he's like, oh, sounds like a plan. Perfect. Do you want an all-inclusive trip to Paris? And I mean all-inclusive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, come on. With I know. turn down service. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or is it turn up service? I know exactly. Um, what the like I know. Oh, this But uh, you know what? Skeevy. He's skeevy. Yeah. And here's always like sign me up, man. I know. Well, I, there's a I'm wondering if there's an aspect of Irizari also thinking like, "Oh, I'm going to get this big drug bust and yep. my job is Because he was gonna, Exactly. Yeah, he was benefit. young, you guys. 25 years old. Yeah. Which, man, I have had so many conversations after looking into this the past couple of days where I'm like, man, at 25, I just sometimes I feel like some people don't necessarily need to be put in a position of power like that. Mm. I mean, I I mean, you can be such a kid still, you know, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. It's had my brain just going for a while now. But I mean, he's only four years into the force. He's probably looking for some notoriety and making a bus like that would be huge. So. Yeah. It could be where he's like, sure, I'll go to Paris, but like also this could be big for me. There's no telling, but clearly he didn't question it literally at all. Yeah. So after this agreement was made and Irizarry's on board, Custodio told him, delete all the text messages, get rid of all the evidence, but still being a police officer, apparently he just didn't do it. <laughs> just forgot, <laughs> you know, just forgot about it. So regardless of that, the plan fell into action almost immediately. So Custodio had everything ready to go. He created a fake email specifically for this setup where he ended up reaching out to Jeff, and this is just days later, claiming to be a man named Shane Carroll. He was like, you know, I need a home. I need you to help me find one. I'm planning on moving to Fort Myers. And he basically asked Jeff if he would take him to check out a few houses. So again, oh, being a real estate broker just was not working for him here. So over the course of the day, the men exchanged emails and texts about the kind of home that Shane Carroll was looking for. And finally, Jeff agreed to meet Shane at a local parking lot at 5 p.m. that day. They were going to go check out a home in the Gulf Harbor community. I get so nervous for realtors. Honestly. <laughs> and it's for reasons just like this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, you know, there's the obvious, like the Lindsay Buziak case. I mean, we've <clears throat> yeah. Realtors uh it's a dangerous occupation um i actually looked into there was a case i looked into recently where it was someone that was an uber driver but then like got suspended oh, no. and yeah. then decided she was going to do private rides and Ooh. i went looking for apps because i know people are doing that and you're not gonna be able to convince yeah. them not to but yeah. there are apps that you can find and realtors in particular there's apps that you can find where uh, it'll set up a trigger mm -hmm. of like, if, if you go pick this guy up and you're like, okay, we're supposed to go showing him houses. Mm -hmm. And two hours after that, if I don't come back to this app and you know tell it that I'm here and put in the special code so it knows it's me, it's going to notify the police. It's going to send GPS information. It's going to notify my six contacts. All of that just happens automatically. It's almost like yeah, if, you would consider it, it's called a dead man switch mm -hmm. typically, but yeah. it's kind of a, you know, you set it up, it gives a a particular time frame and then if you don't get back to it it's like okay boom all this information goes um but yeah. even outside of that that doesn't prevent a crime it and doesn't you're talking about this situation be such an easy target yeah i mean all the guy had to do was hey i need a ride and yeah. oh i'm gonna bring my my briefcase with me uh or my bag mm -hmm. my backpack and he puts it on the ground in the passenger seat slides it open mm -hmm. while the guy is paying attention to driving and just kind of tosses yep. his stuff out under the seat like that's super yep. easy super easy and that is exactly what happened hmm. so at 5 p.m jeff rolls into the parking lot and meets shane carroll aka scott snyder and obviously he has this gigantic briefcase with him but it's easy to be like hey these are just all my documents or i just came straight from work and don't want to leave this in my car there's so many different things that you could say oh yeah um through that briefcase in the back seat of the car and then hopped in to look at houses now after checking out a handful of houses he began to execute this plan of planting drugs so he was kind of working you know fumbling around in the briefcase and interestingly there was actually a moment where jeff was watching him just like fumble in this briefcase for a few minutes straight where he got a little sketched out 
Yeah, like is and this so, guy gonna pull a gun? Like, yeah. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so at that point, he actually did end up taking Snyder, aka Shane. I know this is so confusing. Back to the parking lot, and they parted ways. So mm. there mm. was this moment of hesitation there and of being confused, but unfortunately. The it had all already been done. Yeah. So to give it a little bit of time, make sure that their third man kind of got out of there. This was kind of off his mind a little bit. Irizarry and Custodia planned to wait until the following day to make the actual arrest. So now we're on December 16th, 2022, and the final step of the plan was an action. So Custodio Hold again on, reached out. December 16th, 2021? Yes, that. Okay, got it. You said 2020. My bad. That's okay. I know. Just want to make sure. I don't want to make sure that but, we didn't time travel into the future for this episode. No, we can. <laughs> and then she freezes. Oh, oh she's back. No. no, you're back. I'm back. Okay. I'm I did leave have that time in. Travel. Yeah, that was weird. <laughs> that was that was very weird. <laughs> she just jumped to the future I'm real quick. I'm secretly an alien. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. If you haven't watched the video, go to the video at this moment on YouTube and was... see that. Right after saying that, my whole, like, everything froze. <laughs> Super weird. <laughs> that was. So, Custodio again reached out to the victim pretending to be Shane Carroll. And he's like, you know, I loved the home that we looked at yesterday. And my wife actually wants to be able to come and see it. Is it possible to meet you again? So with her approval, basically, he promised they would be likely purchasing the home. No one's going to pass that up. So obviously, Jeff's like, absolutely, I'll meet you today, 5 p.m., Mexican restaurant parking lot. We'll go look at the home, finalize this. Here we go, right? Super easy. Met the guy one time. That's like a dream for a real estate broker. Hold on a second. Is Custodio in jail during this? <clears throat> no. Oh, he's out. Okay, because I was. Mm -hmm. But how nasty of him that he has to be the one to place that phone call oh, and act yeah. like he's the guy from mm -hmm. the day before. Like I that, know. Like he's just gouging, kind of like. Mm. It's so slimy. It's super slimy. Yeah, yeah. But Shane Carroll would right. never show up. Right. This was how they were going to lure him in for the final arrest. But they had to get him there first. They waited till the absolute last minute just around 5 p.m., like minutes before when Jeff would likely be waiting in the parking lot, Custodia reached out pretending to be Shane again, saying that they weren't going to be able to make it. He gave Jeff this entire sob story about his how his wife got in some big car accident and apologized for the inconvenience. And that was as easy as it was to be like, oh, okay, we'll like go about your way. So since his clients weren't going to make it, Jeff then headed off to call it a night, pulled out of that Mexican restaurant parking lot, and Irizarry was in place, waiting for the perfect moment. That dang rolling stop sign. <laughs> yeah. Well, who knows if he and even did? That was just the exactly, accusation. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so Jeff was pulled over, the drugs were found, and he was arrested. Now, the plan seemed to actually work flawlessly for them originally, but what they hadn't really taken into account, because obviously Custodio sees Jeff as the worst person in the world, was the kind of person Jeff actually is. Mm -hmm. And the character, you know, that everyone knows of him and everyone knew this is not right yeah. at all. Yeah. Like if you ever got arrested for mass drugs, I would personally like walk all the way there and be like, wait a minute. Oh, yeah. yeah. Say that again. <laughs> yeah. No. And I feel, like, like, and I feel was... that about most of our circle. Like, you know, yeah. like we got into this because we're particular <laughs> yep types of people and yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. And so these people knew Jeff the same way. Like this, are, there's just no way this is something that's actually happening. So thanks to an awesome attorney and a very responsive sheriff's department, just to say some tend to turn their cheek to stuff like this, but they immediately were like, absolutely not. Yeah. The seemingly perfect plan had been outed. Now, according to Marcino, quote, the task force utilized state-of-the-art technology to reveal the true names of those involved to identify the and access bogus email accounts and text messages, which essentially laid out the entire plan in front of them like a blueprint and gave a much deeper look into how much Custodio could not stand Jeff. Like this one random witness couldn't stand him. 
So the text messages from Custodio said that he would get Jeff back for what he did, even if it cost him every dime he had. And he frequently spoke about his personal hatred for him, this bitter grudge that he'd been holding on to since 2017. But ultimately, it would cost him not just every dime he had, probably in legal costs, but years of his life that he's now likely going to be spending in prison. Because now, guess who's the one with the trafficking charges? Right and right. possession of controlled substances. So on February 11th, after gathering all evidence, and now we are in 2022. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually in 2022 this time. Yep. Jeff was released on bond, and eventually the charges were dropped, thankfully. But Nico Irizarry was placed on leave by Marcino, ended up being fired later that same day, and then ended up being slapped with felony official misconduct charges. So they immediately went to town on him. Good. That same day, exactly. That same day, Charles Custodio, the mastermind behind it all, was charged with trafficking fentanyl, four counts of possession of a controlled substance, as well as conspiracy. Scott Snyder had, like, absconded to Texas. Yeah. I don't even know. I don't know. He. I don't even think he did it because of this crime. He seems like just like a drifting sure. criminal. Um, and he was arrested, ironically, in the middle of a parking lot for trafficking fentanyl, four counts of possession of a t controlled substance, if I can get that out, and conspiracy. And he was extradited back to Florida to wait for the trial. Now, I have attempted to find court records because Nico and Charles, the officer and then the grudgy man, mm -hmm. they were supposed to have their trials begin in April of this year. Yeah. And I have seen very brief mentions of things stated in those trials, but I've yet to see any sort of outcome. So I don't know if they got paused. Probably. But I might get to another possibility in a bit. But allegedly during the trial, Nico Irizarry said that he agreed to help because he was good friends with Charles, just wanted to help him out. Yeah. And then obviously the promise to trip or did the trip to Paris and sexual favors. And I was <laughs> laughing to myself because almost I kid you not, almost every single article at the very end, it was like, it's unclear if he ever got the trip to Paris or the sexual favors. And I'm like, good grief. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. No, go looking into that because maybe there's like prostitution charges or something else we could throw on this. I just. Well. Oh. Uh oh. So Jeff, again, just as a reminder, that's not his real name, mm -hmm. uh, chose to remain unnamed for obviously safety purposes. That poor man's traumatized at this point. Yeah. Um, but I've also seen it stated that there could possibly be more individuals that were involved in the scheme. Mm. Mm. So that's another reason why they've not shared a lot of information. Yeah. Apparently, well, allegedly about the trial and because there could still be more charges to come. Okay. And so my only guess with that is they had a canine officer come out there, but like that could very they didn't wouldn't have to include a canine officer in it if they know for a fact drugs will be in the car yeah maybe they're i don't know but i mean that was kind of the consensus that i found online so wow i just knows? i love how the charge mm -hmm. that they were intending to lay on jeff just completely Came right back to bite him yeah like a boomerang it just blew up right mm -hmm. in their face instead like that's yep that's awesome i mean that's uh, that's the universe exacting revenge. Like, yep, exactly. Know, this guy They're put like, a revenge. No. You yeah. know what? <laughs> right. This guy puts out a revenge plot that he thinks he's the brilliant mastermind, and the universe yep. just goes, nope, <laughs> boom. Exactly. <laughs> and you know what? Poor freaking Jeff, you guys. He ended up hiring security after this. Yeah. Because, of I mean, he felt so unsafe, and he's already in a potentially dangerous line of work highly traumatized by the event understandably and i feel like there's already such an issue with the willingness to come forward as a witness because mm -hmm. of this exact reason yeah um you know you put your neck on the line to tell the truth and there's just this lack of protection afterwards and it would be near impossible probably to protect everyone that comes forward as a witness but it's just like it just seems like such a crappy situation no matter which way you look at it i honestly feel for him i hope that at some point he has some sense of peace in his life it should help if this guy's charged and put away hopefully he won't continue to try to come for him how do you think he he's gonna to feel do the right dang thing yeah how do you think he's gonna feel anytime he sees a police car exactly like that's never gonna I mean, change you know exactly i mean that's 
Mm. You should be able to trust that situation. And now yeah. it's just going to be triggering and incredibly fearful all the time when he sees that. So oh, I can't stand it for him, but I'm so happy because I feel like this could have gone the opposite way. Mm -hmm. I think had just a few things been different, this very easily could have been swept under the rug, ignored. And then this poor man, you guys would have probably spent decades in prison for this. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. All because he was a witness of many that came right before the sentencing yeah. and conviction. It's absolutely ridiculous. Hmm. Um, huge thank you to Fox for now, The Washington Post, NBC News, and Orlando Sentinel for today's story. Wow. Mm. That's a good one, Danielle. The revenge I mean, layer is later. crazy. Yeah. But you've also got, a, you've got like a double hit on the revenge yeah. that's going on with, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, Jeff doesn't need to exact revenge. Mm -hmm. He was just a nope. good person. It was recognized by other people. I mean, even mm -hmm. for his attorney to be like, okay, we're going to go ahead and hire a private investigator. Like, his attorney had to like be pretty, right away. Yeah. yeah, had to be pretty convinced of like this guy didn't do this. Like, and we need to figure out what's going on around this. I'm just thankful those guys weren't so smart about their records that they just left all that oh, stuff I know. in Good places grief. where yeah, once it was found, it kind of just laid mm. out the whole plan. But yep. Well, Danielle, you have certainly given me a big task today. Can I take that story on? We're going to find out right after this commercial break. HelloFresh is here to make your hectic fall weeknights a little easier and a whole lot more delicious. Their quick and easy meals take the stress out of mealtime with time-saving, no-fuss recipes that are ready in a snap. Oh, really, Danielle? John starts acting incredibly petty when he's hungry. Oh, do I, Danielle? Do I? Yes, John, you do. Enjoy the freshest fall flavors with HelloFresh. Every recipe includes just picked produce that travels from the farm to your door in less than a week. And HelloFresh is 72% cheaper than dining at a restaurant. Plus, I hate mm -hmm. grocery shopping. So many people breathing everywhere. This week, I had the zucchini and sun-dried tomato panini. So much flavor. This isn't just a sandwich, Danielle. This panini is completely dinner worthy, especially when you pair it up with roasted potato wedges. I feel better just even thinking about HelloFresh. Hmm. There we go. All you have to do is go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime16 and use code CrimeAfterCrime16 for up to 16 free meals across seven boxes and three free gifts. For excellent restaurant quality meals every time without all those breathing people. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime16 and use code CrimeAfterCrime16 for up to 16 free meals across seven boxes and your three free gifts. Try America's number one meal kit today. Really, Danielle? Yes, John. <laughs> All right, everyone. Welcome back. John, you talked up your story, so mm. I'm a little nervous. You've just been bringing it time and time again, so I'm excited. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, oh, your story was so good. I think I have one component that has a little edge on you, and I think it's the pettiness. Ooh. And I think yeah. as demonstrated in that HelloFresh commercial, I truly know pettiness. You do. And I think You're I tapped into it. it. Yeah, so let's let's <laughs> let's see. We'll give it a shot here. New Year's resolutions, Danielle. New Year's resolutions, they remind us that we can still change and take steps to make sure that the next year is better than the last. And I believe that Ray Lazier Lengend had a New Year's resolution. He was mad as hell and he wasn't going to take it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> On Sunday, December 31st, 2011, unemployed 40-year-old tow truck driver Ray drove a silver Buick to a convenience store located at an Amoco gas station on Hillside Avenue in New York. I'm not sure if it's Amoco or Amoco. Either way you want it, there you had it both. He wanted to <laughs> buy five, quote, prepared Frappuccino coffee drinks, as the okay. new newspapers are saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm almost certain that we're talking about those Starbucks fraps. You know the okay. ones, Danielle? Yeah, Super, absolutely. super, super good. And they come in that mm -hmm. nice bottle. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, he says he wanted to buy five, 
but the store decided to give him three for free, which I'm totally not believing because those things are like three bucks a piece. Yeah, they're pretty pricey. Yeah. I don't think you walk into a store and they're like, oh, yeah, sure. Here, pay for two of them, but take <laughs> Just three. Just take them, man. Take three Go more. for it. Yeah, I don't think so. But regardless, you can tell that this man loves his Frappuccino. And... Delicious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as a plus, he's also into recycling. He drives That's to... Always good. Yeah. He drives to another gas station, <laughs> now with five empty Frappuccino yeah. bottles, and he decides to fill them up with gasoline. Ray had just made five firebombs and he had a specific plan for each one. Around 8 p.m., Ray drove to a deli on 179th Street but saw that there was a lot of people there, so he decided he'd come back later. He drove to a mosque in Queens, but there he saw too many police officers. It sounds almost like the story of Goldilocks, Danielle, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. so, it's not fitting yet. Yeah, so he decided to go back to the deli and now it was just right. He went inside, <laughs> he lit the bottle, and he screamed as he threw it. Now, it didn't hit anyone. It did break on the ground in the kitchen and started spreading dangerous flames everywhere. Thankfully, a deli employee was able to quickly put the fire out, and thankfully, no one was hurt. Now, Ray had started his firebombing rampage, a rampage that would continue for more than two hours. And even though he wasn't particularly oh effective gosh. at the first location, things would be quite different when he went to a private home located on 107th in Queens. He threw another firebomb, which caught the home on fire and caused substantial damage. I think in that one, he actually got it through the front window. It landed oh gosh, in the living yeah. room. Yeah. And just the place went up. He went back to the mosque that he initially scoped out. It's the Imam al Koi Foundation. He threw a firebomb there during a service with nearly 100 people in attendance. Ugh. He went to two more private residences and hurled more firebombs, but the home of his last attack wasn't just a, a private house. It also served yeah. as a Hindu temple. Ooh. All of Ray's attacks were within a two-mile radius. Mayor Bloomberg promised the city that they would not tolerate discrimination, and the NYPD was all over this case. Now, that silver Buick that Ray was driving, he had originally planned to use a rental car. So he went to Kennedy International Airport to the Avis counter there, but for some reason they refused to rent him one. So he yeah. went back at 3 a.m. in the middle of the night and stole it. Now, being a rental car, it didn't have New York plates. It had Virginia plates. And as he was driving around throwing these firebombs, several witnesses told law enforcement, yeah, it was a car with Virginia plates. <laughs> you just made yourself stick out like a sore thumb. <laughs> Seriously. So, and they ran that back and they're like, oh, well, we've got this report of a stolen car and it's matching this description. So now they have the plate information. They also found footage from the gas station where he filled up the Starbucks bottles with gasoline and... They went to the deli. The deli actually had a composite sketch of him that was already made. Why was that already there? You'll find out soon. <laughs> Two detectives who were canvassing the Jamaica, Queens neighborhood find the car. It's parked. They stake it out. They're there, I think, practically the whole night. At 7.50 a.m. in the morning on uh, the following Tuesday, Ray comes out. He's headed to the car. It's the morning, Danielle. He's probably craving a delicious Starbucks Frappuccino. But Absolutely. he got the popo instead. Ray was finally apprehended about 36 hours after the crimes that he committed. And honestly, I just want to say that's some good police work. And we're talking New it York. It seriously is. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's incredible. A lot of people out there. Thankfully, because there's a lot of people, you had a lot of witnesses, a lot of information came together yeah, really exactly. quick. Uh, the New York Times reported that Ray had been arrested several times in the past for charges including drug possession, grand larceny, possession of bad checks. I mean, this guy's done it all, it sounds like. Uh, when he was caught for his firebombing, Ray just decides he's going to turn into an open book. He gave very specific and extremely petty reasons for each. Oh, my gosh. He claims the mosque was targeted <laughs> Because the officials there denied him access, Danielle. Access to what? <laughs> a restroom. Ugh. Petty? How, Check. How Revenge? dare they? Check. 
<laughs> they wouldn't let him use the restroom. So he firebombed the mosque. Perfectly reasonable. <laughs> now, the first home that he attacked out of the three, yeah. <clears throat> it belonged to a drug dealer that Ray was having issues with. Basically, he wasn't happy with the crack that he was buying from this guy. Again, unacceptable. Reasonable <laughs> response, firebomb. <laughs> if you're going to buy crack, it's got to it's got to be good crack, right? It's got to be good crack. <laughs> what the <laughs> Now, slight problem with that revenge plan. Uh he got the street <laughs> right, but he got the address wrong. No. Even if his pettiness was a real excuse for this, which obviously it's not, he torched uh, someone's uh, home who never wronged him at all. Mm. And uh, another one of those homes, he told police about familial issues that caused him to hurl a firebomb at the second private house, something referring to his brother-in-law named Bubba. Ray? Oh, man. He just, he can't let things go, Danielle. No, clearly not. Yeah. I mean, he's held on to every single thing that's ever happened to him. Yeah. Well, and combine that with the fact that he's jacked up on five tasty frappuccinos. I mean, it's, I, you know, Starbucks might have some accountability. He's in this. letting loose. I'm just going to put out there <laughs> that those frappuccinos are a little too good. <laughs> uh, the third home, the one that also happened to be a Hindu temple. Mm -hmm. Well, he says that a nemesis of his from five or six years ago was there. You know, my nemesis, my nemesis was there. So I, I had to firebomb this Hindu temple. Uh, Ramesh Mahara is the owner of that home and the priest of the Hindu temple. He said, quote, I have nothing against anybody and I don't think anybody should have anything against me. Thankfully, <laughs> poor person's like, wait a minute. What? I mean, no, seriously, I didn't do anything. <laughs> you didn't do anything. What's going on? <laughs> yeah. Someone just threw a firebomb at my house. Luckily, oh my it, that one fell way short of the home. Uh, I believe that one just landed in the front yard and basically burned some grass. Uh, but what about the deli, Danielle? And why did they yeah, have Yeah, why a, did they have that? Yeah, why did they have a composite sketch of Ray already? <clears throat> well, the people at the deli were targeted because less than a week before he firebombed them, they were angry with Ray and kicked him out of the store. What happened? Well, the owner of the store, 32-year-old Salah Salim, broke down the details for the New York Times. It was December 27th. And Salah said an employee saw the man stealing. This would be the second time that they had caught Ray shoplifting there. So Salah went to confront him. Quote, at first, he gives me the milk back, recalled Salah. He said, I'm sorry, I have nothing else. And then my employee said, there's one more. Salah said he grabbed Ray by his jacket collar. And Ray pulled out a bottle from his coat. A bottle of what, Danielle? Let me guess. <laughs> Delicious Starbucks, Starbucks Frappuccino. <laughs> the men argued, and as Ray was being kicked out, uh, witnesses state that they heard Ray say words to the effect of, we're going to get even, we're going to get back at you. A bottle of Starbucks Frappuccino. He was kicked out of the convenience store, and then he came back to try to burn it down using the very same type of bottle that mm -hmm. he was trying to steal. It's like he's poetic. That's Danielle. a level of petty like no other. Am I right? Like I think on the petty. Good grief. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like taking it down. Ta I mean, taking it down. Danielle, don't deny this man a restroom. Don't sell him bad crack. And for God's I sake, know. if he comes in wanting a Frappuccino, give him the Frappuccino. For free, just give it to him. <laughs> yes. And tell him to get rid of the bottle after he's done drinking it. Yeah, uh, seriously. Yeah. I might actually take the Frappuccino, pour it into a plastic cup, and then give it to Ray. Okay. Now exactly. Yeah. That's a good safe idea. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, so basically what had happened was it was the second time that Ray was kicked out of the store for theft. They called the police. They ran the surveillance footage for them, and the police... Mm -hmm drew up a composite sketch based on the surveillance footage. So that's how they had a composite already. So while Ray was blabbering all these terrible excuses to the investigators, trying to convince them that these reasons were something a normal person would actually mm -hmm. understand, things went a little dark. Oh, no. He also stated... I knew there had to be some sort of turn like that. Yeah. Well, not for the deli, but he also stated that he hated Arabs, Muslims, and Middle Easterners 
and specifically in the we won't let you use our bathroom mosque bombing, he said he had intended to, quote, take out as many Arabs as possible. So Mr. Firebomber Ray is now pushing into hate crime territory. Yeah, exactly. Which also goes federal. We'll get to that. Thankfully, no one was injured in any of his attacks. Police Commissioner Ray Kelly said, quote, He's all over the lot with motives, and obviously his mental capacity is being examined. Yeah, Ray I was, was asked about that. Yeah, he was sent to Bellevue for psychiatric examination. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see any outcome from that, and they did continue with pressing charges on him. So he was obviously found fit to to face those charges. Uh, Just a very angry human being. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Assistant DA Donald Jeffrey said prosecutors would seek four consecutive 25-year terms. He said the targets Ooh. were occupied when the firebomb struck and there was potential for tremendous carn carnage and harm. Mm -hmm. And despite his petty and lame excuses, prosecutors also thought the attack on the mosque was a clear hate crime. Quote, yeah. hate crimes and arson are a volatile mix meant to inflict suffering and intimidation on its victims. And that came from Queens District Attorney Richard Brown. Uh, in this case, the targets of the defendant's hate-filled arson attack range from private dwellings to houses of worship and endanger the lives of those within the buildings, as well as the firefighters called to respond to the scene, the DA continued. Ray was charged in a 36-count indictment, including arson as a hate crime, grand larceny, reckless endangerment, criminal possession of a weapon, and endangering mm -hmm. the welfare of a child. They must have had children at one of the services, probably. Yeah, probably. And apparently... Even Ray came to grips with his motivation. He actually winds up pleading guilty to one charge, attempted arson mm -hmm. as a hate crime. And that charge yeah. alone gives him 20 years in prison, followed by five years of post-release supervision. That happens at the state court level. Yeah. But he was also charged federally. The following mm -hmm. year, in December of 2018, he was sentenced to 18 years and 10 months in prison to be followed by three years of supervised release they are running those sentences concurrently. So basically he's he's in prison for 20 years and then he's watched yeah. for five when he comes out. Uh, FBI assistant director in charge Sweeney said, today we learn the consequences of his despicable actions. His sentence should serve as a reminder the FBI will never waver in its commitment to protecting and preserving the rights of all Americans, including the free exercise of one's chosen religion. Maybe Ray should have had a different New Year's resolution. Yeah. Yeah, like forgiveness, forgiving people mm -hmm. who uh, deny you bathrooms, bad crack, and pricey Starbucks wraps. Oh, and maybe get a job on top of yeah, that. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, something else. Focus on something positive here. <laughs> seriously. Imagine living, I mean, imagine living like that. Just hate filled Just, every day. Exactly. And then, like, the whole thing about doing it on New Year's Day, like, yeah. it's just such a message. It's such, like, it's an F you to the world in a way that's. Yeah, exactly. It's really. So even if you're not someone big on New Year's resolutions or anything, I feel like that's such a, like, refreshing day for everyone. Like, this is a new start. It's a new year, you know? And for someone to so willingly go into that and be like, yeah, I'm going to take all this out. Yeah. <laughs> Like, yeah. good grief. A uh, big thank you to the New York Post, Patch.com, FBI.gov, Justice.gov, the New York Times, the LA Times, Times Tribune, and CBS News for information contributing to today's story. You knocked it out of the park again. I mean, those it, are some petty, dumb. It's really reasons. dumb, isn't it? Like, do you know how many crimes I would commit? <laughs> how many, Danielle? If Tell I'm, us. I'm, I'm so serious. Like, I'm just saying, if, you like, got if hung we up all on committed a crime, yeah, getting yeah. hung up on things like that all the time, mm -hmm. we would live in an even scarier world. Yeah. Yeah. Thankfully, people don't. And yeah. I don't know. I feel like exactly. I'm trying to remember, like, when I was a kid, did I try revenge at some point or something? I just know it. Like, my belief in it is it is exactly. absolutely terrible for your soul. Yep. Like it, it is, it will hurt you to do it. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think there's any aspect of it that feels good. I don't know how this guy Not at all. gets to the end of that day and then goes, Oh, I did it. I finally like, yeah. What's that like? You know, I know seriously. And especially because in a few of his attacks, like they were super lame. Like he, yeah. <laughs> he lit the kitchen mm -hmm. floor on fire. Oh no. Exactly. He lit front someone's yard. Yeah. Front yard on fire. Like 
But even uh, and like also, know. why didn't he get rid of the car that he stole? Like it just all of it just I feel like his head was just in such a bad place. Yeah, that there was no thinking outside of that, and yeah. that's I think what scares me so much about revenge, especially when it's petty revenge like this. If you are like in the headspace to where these small things will push you to do things like that, right? You're not thinking about anything other than your anger yeah. and hatred, and that is it, and that scares the. Woo! Out of me. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a bad it place. <laughs> yeah, it's a bad place to be stuck in, and uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure it, it just changes your perspective on the world or, or yep. around you and what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I kind of have this secret hope. I don't know if it's possible because they're not in the same state. I don't believe. I just I wish that Ray would wind up in the same cell with the guy from last month with Ryan Stone and that Ray would just have to listen to that laugh over and over over. all the time they would drive each other insane I I fully believe that (laughs) I fully fully believe that oh my gosh Hmm. dang all right well there we go there we go revenge scares me yeah 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 interesting episode today kind of weird stuff to look into but we're not done. We've got some extra stories for you guys. Um, I know, and we gotta we gotta end that one out on yeah yeah a better note because it's like I was saying. I just don't think John and I are made for <laughs> petty <laughs> revenge. It makes me uncomfortable. Yeah, it makes me so uncomfortable. Uh, Danielle, I think we only we're gonna go two on this. So okay. pick pick your favorite two. You ready? Yep. Let's do it. All right. So this one is near and dear to me and i cannot wrap my head around it and it actually reminds me interestingly it's a lot like your story in certain ways okay um a woman from north carolina not too far from me had Uh-oh. her heart set on revenge okay breakups are not easy okay i get it i get it and sometimes your emotions can get the best of you so after struggling through a breakup this woman's like you know what the best way to handle this is to set my ex-boyfriend's house on fire what the only problem here and yes i'm being very facetious there but one of the largest ones is that somehow she burned down the wrong house. <laughs> oh, she pulled a ray. <laughs> she did. She pulled a ray. Oh. Okay, so this is in Rowan County, in North Carolina. Sheriffs were called out to a home early, early morning hours, late July. So not even that long ago, when a homeowner was awoken by a very concerned neighbor. This neighbor's like, "Hey, just thought I'd let you know that you have a woman running around your house trying to set it on fire." He goes out of his front door. You guys. A fire reminiscent of an actual campfire has been set on his front porch. Okay. Like, like a literal bundle of logs. Yeah. It was set on fire using like chainsaw oil or something. It was like slowly smoldering on the front porch. Okay. Other fires had been set around the house. One of them did scare me. It's like my biggest fear beside a propane tank. She lit a fire there and that like scares me super bad. But the homeowner's like, you have to be joking. So he goes to grab a hose. She freaking flex sealed the hose shut. Uh, what? I kid you not. And keep in mind, all of this effort, and somehow she has mixed up the house yeah. that her boyfriend, ex-boyfriend lived in, right? Oh, all that so, planning and yeah. I know. So the homeowner eventually catches sight of this woman, and she had his dog on a leash, and she's just like standing beside her car watching all of this happened. I don't know how she got the dog. Again, many questions. But she's probably thinking that, oh, this place is going to burn down. I'm going to I'm going to bring the dog out so that the dog doesn't die in this. Yeah, totally possible. Yeah. That's what I'm hoping. But also, how did your did your boyfriend have, also have a dog like right. that? The whole thing just has me very confused. But if you knew this area of North Carolina, kind of makes sense. Was she jacked now, up on, on fraps? I'm honestly wondering or something <laughs> else. I think it's possible. Now, he ended up confronting her with a rifle in hand, and after mumbling something under her breath, which I'm hoping was, oh, crap, this is not my ex-boyfriend, she then jumps into her car, proceeds to hit him with it, and drives off. Oh, my goodness. It's okay. He saw her license plate. Her license plate number took her down. 
Police arrived. 49-year-old Christy Louise Jones was found and charged with felony first-degree arson, assault with a deadly weapon, since she was like, I'm going to hit you with my car now, and um, also larceny of an animal because she stole this man's dog. Mm. And one of my favorite parts about this story is that she was held on, get this, $101,500 bond. Bizarre. You want to know why it's funny? 101.5 is like, a well-known and loved radio station around here. <laughs> and so I'm like, what did they like? Were they listening to the radio when they said that? And they're like, oh man, 101.5, that makes perfect sense. Let's do it. Yeah, the judge that morning on the drive-in, oh, I'm loving this 101.5. I got to remember that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So the whole thing is just an absolute disaster. Mm. $20,000 in damages. She swears she was trying to do this to get back at her ex-boyfriend. Like that makes this it okay. Poor unsuspe- I know this poor unsuspecting victims. Like what? How did you mess this one up? <laughs> oh goodness. Oh goodness. Well, in 2010, Danielle, mm-hmm. a 22 year old man was getting ready to get on a bus in San Francisco okay. early evening. He uh, opens his wallet. He's thumbing through his bills when a 40 year old Hispanic woman snatched a ten dollar bill from him. Oh. Just you know, he's thumbing through his money. Just snap takes a ten dollar bill right Runs. so he stops her he's wrestling with her gets the ten dollars back but now she wants her petty revenge danielle oh no it's that she, cycle she took the ten dollars or he took the ten dollars away from mm-hmm. her so she grabs his cell phone and throws it down in the street breaking it <laughs> if you're not gonna let me have the ten dollars i'm gonna break your cell phone i'm gonna break your cell phone well, you mean you're not just going to willingly let me steal your money? Yeah. No. Where are these people <laughs> coming from? That's... I genuinely don't know. I don't understand it. Like my brain cannot wrap itself around these things. Yeah. I mean, that's only going to buy you like three, three Starbucks perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> she got arrested. Unfortunately, her, her name wasn't released in any of the coverage. So I yeah. can't tell you if charges were filed. The man did suffer minor injuries, but he refused medical treatment so i assume he's okay but his cell what phone a scuffle man yeah his cell phone's broken now <laughs> that sucks oh my gosh all right now this one probably hits on another handful of my favorite things ever so just a few weeks ago again since people are apparently feeling particularly petty lately so everybody watch your back andrew roush reached out to problem solvers of denver to help him out Apparently, just days prior, he had gone out of his front door to find a steaming pile of human crap on his front lawn. What? Now, apparently, just days earlier, before this steaming pile of human crap, he had posted on one of my favorite drama-watching websites possible, Nextdoor. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) If you know, you know. Yes, yes. If you know, you know. (laughs) And he was one of those people, he was complaining. He was like, these pet owners are not picking up after their animals. There is dog crap all over my lawn. I'm gonna get cameras to catch you. He was mad, understandably, you know, this, I have a fly. Okay, I got it. From Minnesota. It is, it is. He was so irritated that these people were leaving this poop on his lawn. And he installed these cameras thinking he was going to catch who's doing it. And instead, he caught a man walking his dog. And as soon as he gets to this man's property, this guy turns around, pulls his pants down, broad daylight, okay? Broad daylight, takes a crap on his lawn. (laughs) This man's obviously like, oh, you're mad at me because I won't pick up my animals. Poop, fine. I'll poop on your lawn, too. Wow. (laughs) That is petty. They can't find the guy. They don't know who he is. They're trying to identify him still. Oh, they know who he is. The neighborhood's protecting this guy. Like, oh, yeah, absolutely. He got him. <laughs> I know. The whole thing. I'm just like, you got to be joking. That's like the most next door thing I've ever heard. This it is like a constant is. thing in my area. People are like, <gasps> I'm like, oh, you people. Oh, my goodness. Oh, all right. We got one more to close this out. 2016, Danielle, in Alabama, mm-hmm. a married couple was fighting in a Taco Bell. Oh, man. Now. Rough times. I love Taco Bell. And it, there's there mm-hmm. should be no violence happening. And everyone should, should be so happy. You should be happy. <laughs> yes, in Taco Bell. But <laughs> Suzanne was having a burrito, and she wasn't happy with her husband Carl's ongoing alcoholism. He stopped eating his Mexican pizza, 
put the fork down, and he started walking away. Well, Suzanne wasn't going to let things go that easy. She, Absolutely not. She threw the, her burrito and hit him in the back of the head. <laughs> so what did Carl do? He picked up his plastic fork from his Mexican pizza, and he buried the fork in her hand. Oh, my gosh. That just escalated so absurdly fast. Seriously. It's like they're... Like, they're, what? <gasps> yeah. Whoosh. They're going John Wick in a, in a Taco Bell. I know. Uh, <laughs> now, thankfully, police didn't have to call out the CSI because uh, they took photos of Suzanne's injury, and they were able to, quote, find evidence of the burrito as remnants were scattered about the scene of the okay. crime. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. I couldn't believe I was reading that. I'm like, this is a real news article saying this. Oh, but my goodness. Carl had took off. Carl fled. He did? Yeah. Well, he wasn't I at the mean, scene. when you stab someone in the hand, <laughs> so, I'm sure he did run. But officers, you know, they talked to Suzanne a little bit, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. they get a pretty clear idea of where to work, or where to work, where to look. He was at a nearby bar. Oh my gosh, you're joking. <laughs> no, he went right for a bar. <laughs> He's like, I need a drink after this. Yeah. So when officers found him, Full they, circle. they questioned him about the attack. And he said he only threw the plastic fork at his wife. And oh, okay. They go, really? We've got these photos. They showed the photos. And apparently, Danielle, several of the fork tines were literally buried in her hand. Oh. They had to be removed at a medical center. So Ooh. police arrested him. Carl was charged with aggravated battery. But Suzanne was also charged with second degree domestic violence of a burrito. Yeah, well. <laughs> uh I mean, you can't just go around throwing burritos. That's You cannot go around throwing burritos. Don't or, waste them like that. Yeah, or stabbing people <laughs> in the hand. And hey, Mexican no. pizzas, like those are rare. You got to appreciate those. That should be a, a good moment. I actually just learned that those were a thing the other day. Oh, you don't know about the Mexican pizza? I don't know about oh. them. I don't know. I never go to fast food. Like I never eat it. And I definitely don't ever go to Taco Bell usually because I that's like Mexican cuisine, anything like that, I it's like my favorite kind of food to cook. So usually oh, if I want yeah, something like yeah. that, I am making it for myself. <laughs> uh, the Mexican pizza was, they removed it from the menu. Popular demand brought it back. Brought it back. People wanted it so bad. And then they ran out of stock because people were buying it so often. It's been gone again. he just again. walked away from his. Yeah. And now it's back <laughs> because uh, Taco Bell's saying, okay, we've got the, we've got the uh, supply chain under control. We can give you guys Mexican pizzas again. But don't give oh, one dang. to Carl. Keep them away no, from No, don't. Carl. And also, like, why was that conversation happening in a public place like that? There's just, you know, yeah. a lot going on. Yeah. A lot going on there. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't, I don't want to downplay the domestic violence <clears throat> stuff. I mean, that's yeah. They these are people that obviously need help, but um, yeah, because that was very intense. Mm-hmm. Burying a fork in someone's like that's yes, that's serious. That's really, really serious. But oh my gosh! Oh, All right, well, we made it. It's that time. Mm -hmm. It's that time. Who is going to win this month? John's taken it the past two, so. I don't in know. the most encouraging way possible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Vote no. for Danielle. No, not necessarily. Because you actually, that was a good one. The pettiness of yours, honestly, I don't think I can touch that. Yeah. That was perfect. It was actually really hard to find. You know, I feel like most of the petty crimes were very kind of Fringe. on the more extreme end. Or like yeah. there was no story to it. So that must have taken a lot of good research work because I was I did not find that story. I was having a hard time. So your you I mean, your story on the revenge tip, like it's such a strong thread of it. Mm -hmm. So I'm really curious to see which way the audience goes. I think I nailed the petty, but you nailed the revenge. Yep. So I don't know. Oh man. I don't well, know what's gonna happen. We'll see. It's not up to us. It is up to you guys. You guys get to vote who told the best petty revenge story. And you can vote at the Twitter account at Crime After Pod for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also have a link in the description box down below. You can still click the little letter I and vote there as well. At crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. 
Also, a huge thank you to our patrons. We absolutely love creating a Patreon special segment for you guys monthly. Lots of interesting things happen there. Plus, mm-hmm. our patrons get a personal shout out in an upcoming Patreon special. Absolutely. We'll be back next month. What's next month? It's October. And with that, mm-hmm. we are bringing Halloween crimes. I'm so surprised we haven't done this yet, but it's here. Halloween crimes for uh-huh. you guys coming next Broad. Month. There's no telling what's happening. Mm-mm. This show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Hyland, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. And the best way that you can help others find us is to tell them. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell everyone that you love crime after crime. And if they come and hang out with us, we're going to have fun and tell them a bunch of silly stories. That's basically Mm -hmm. what we do. (laughs) Thank you guys so much. We'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.